Good morning, Tom in California, and good afternoon and evening to the panelists over here in Europe. And hello to all the visitors on the screen, wherever you watch this second online panel discussion of Aero 2020. As you know, Aero 2020 has been canceled due to the coronavirus, like many other events around the world. Over the last years, we have established the eFlight Expo and the panel discussions there has been a highlight of the show, packed with news from electric aviation, from Volocopter over Siemens up to Uber Elevate. We want to keep this tradition and inform you on the latest news in electric aviation. That's why we invited you to the electric online panel discussion, our second subject, UAM traffic men, how to control eVTOL air taxis. We have on the panel, Tom Prevost, Uber Director of Engineering, Airspace Systems, Marcus May, Director, Airbus Urban Mobility, Corbin Hoover, CEO of D3 Tech DMBH, and Christian Bauer of Motocopter. So Tom, it's yours, let us know Uber's vision, how this could work. Yes. Okay, so uh, let me let me know uh, when when I should start. Are you start right now? We are fine. Okay. It's all recorded. And I have to do some cutting afterwards. Okay. Hey, uh, thank you, Billy, and um, good morning or good afternoon, uh, whatever time it is at in your place right now. Um, so at Uber Elevate, our vision is to to weave the everyday flight of people and things into the the Uber platform. Um, so for us, it is extremely important to provide an end-to-end -end, um, customer journey from, from where they are to where they want to go. Uh, and, and they can just uh, do this right through the, the Uber app and, and do it in a very, um, uh, in, in an airplane uh, that is electric, that is quiet, um, and uh, that is acceptable to the communities. So... In some sense, we, we believe that the, the air trip and urban air mobility needs to be part of a multimodal aerial ride sharing trip where people take some means of transportation uh, to the first skyport then board the aircraft, fly to another skyport and then seamlessly go into their last mile transportation and get to their destination. Uh, in Uber's case, of course, this entire trip uh, can be managed through our services. And again, one push a button, get the whole trip arranged for you. Uh, if we want to talk a little bit about the aircraft, here's an example of an electric aircraft concept uh, that's been developed by, by Uber uh, to kind of showcase what the properties of the aircraft should be. I mean, we believe that uh, this uh, is only going to be a, a real form of uh, good transportation uh, if it's acceptable to the community and if we get it to a price point where, where lots of people can use it and it's not just a, a, a very niche thing. We, we're looking for broad adoption and some of the key elements to make that work is that the aircraft needs to have enough speed, payload and range. Uh, it, it needs to be environmentally friendly. So like here in all electric aircraft, you're utilizing distributed electric propulsion. Uh, so it, it can be very quiet, even during uh, takeoff and landing. It should be quieter than, than uh, much quieter than helicopters. And during the, the en route portion of the flight, you will barely able to hear it at all. And it, of course, needs to be uh, incredibly safe. Uh, and uh, again, there's, there's opportunities with these uh, electric aircraft, for example, to have re redundant systems, or you can lose an uh, one of the rotors and you can still fly safely so so there's a number of safeguards um, that will also be looked at uh, during certification of, of these vehicles uh, in order to make them acceptable to the communities um, we, we do think the aircraft of course is one important piece uh, that needs to come together in the uh, to, to make all of this happen um, and, but the other pieces are also connected skyports um, places where these aircraft can take off and, and land. Um, and we're working with a number of, of real estate companies also to 
uh, kind of make this happen. We're working with, with uh, folks who have designed uh, skyports for different throughput in certain places. But these areas, electric aircraft and connected spike, uh, skyports, are certainly areas where we partner a lot with other people. Uh, the, the other elements is what I mentioned before. One is the multimodal aerial ride sharing, uh, being able to uh, very seamlessly take a trip from A to B um, and, and have a car pick you up like I described before and, and have the air, air trip integrated. And then the last part, of course, is the airspace integration um, that we believe is kind of an extension of um, where UTM, unmanned traffic management, has just started for small drones and we want to kind of build on that um, and, and weave everything into what we call like our UTM system would be the Elevate Cloud Services um, that can interact with other providers in there as well. So the, the right hand side, multimodal aerial ride sharing and the Elevate Cloud Services is, are certainly things that Uber is building in-house uh, and, and that we think are kind of core to, to our competencies and what we can do. Uh, on the left hand side, again, for the vehicles, we are partnering uh, with, with a lot of companies, uh, great companies, uh, Bell, Boeing, Embraer, X, Jaunt, Joby, Karam, and Pipistrel. And specifically, Joby is on a, on a very, on a great path to potentially being uh, certified in a few years. So uh, we are very uh, confident that this can, can actually, service can start up in a few years from now. Um, we want to talk a little bit about more about the airspace integration and the way that we see it. We, we do think that our systems will have to uh, interoperate with the traditional air traffic control and air traffic management systems in some ways or forms, just like uh, the pilots will have to do. There will be cases where, where these aircraft operate just in, in, in a current day environment, even though that's not our preferred mode of operations, but they should be equipped if it's needed to, to be able to do that. Uh, and our systems also will need to share uh, some information with, with those. Uh, we also, uh, of course, need to have the connection to actually the rider, uh, the customers that are using this uh, system and, and the pilots that are, that are on board here. Um, another important aspect, again, is the connection into the larger UAS traffic management network. Uh, we, we believe it should be a fairly distributed uh, system where there can be multiple providers of these services and Uber would be, would be one of them. But we, we do have to, in order to safely share the airspace with um, other users, uh, we have to properly share all the information with other UTM providers and with other services. And, and we're working very heavily with NASA and the FAA actually on um, the protocols, the rules, the, the regulations that govern these things and, and with the other industry companies as well in, in identifying the, the right standards um, for, for this data exchange. And of course, everything uh, we we're also seeing that we need to manage our uh, operations from a, a network operations uh, center where humans provides oversight about what's going to be fairly automated uh, operations or automated airspace integration. Initially, we do fully intend to operate with pilots. Um, and maybe later on, as we've proven all these things out, uh, we might be able to move to autonomy. Um, we are already um, operating a service called Ubercopter in New York that allows us to uh, really develop our um, multimodal ride sharing, um, aerial ride sharing, um, muscle, so to speak. Um, so right now you can get a flight from downtown Manhattan to JFK, um, or a multimodal trip, I should say. You order it through the app, a car will pick you up, take you to uh, a heliport, uh, a helicopter flies you to JFK. Uh, we dispatch another car along the way that at the moment you step out of the helicopter and out of the, the um, mm, out of the terminal there, you, you get into another car that takes you to, to your uh, final terminal. So, so we we're starting to develop these systems on the, uh, already in order to get ready for what we think is uh, currently our launch dates uh, for Uber Air. Uber Air then being with uh, eVTOLs with electric aircraft uh, for 2023 in Los Angeles, Melbourne, Australia, and Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, which we've announced as our launch markets. 
And finally, I just uh, I want to show you a video sort of with the vision of uh, what a journey in an Uber Air could uh, look like uh, in a few years from now. So as you saw in the video, there was certainly a time shift started out a little more near term and the, the, the skypod that was shown in the end is probably a few more years out than, than at launch later on. But this can hopefully get you an impression of how we kind of envision the future. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you, Tom. And thank you for this vision. And I think we now can go on to the next, which will be Marcus from uh, Airbus? Um, so basically I started off saying that uh, in uh, 2030 we will have 60% of the world population living in mega cities and there is a future a current and a future trend towards that. Um, obviously there is a dream if you look at cities like Sao Paulo and a dream that is partially reality today. So even today you have the chance to uh, take a helicopter flight and uh, in 10 minutes you get from the airport to the city center. Whereas a, a comparable trip by taxi would take uh, up to two hours. Um, and that is something that is a reality today, but it's certainly not a mass market today. And uh, to get there, there are two things that are happening at the moment in the aerospace industry. There is on the one hand, uh, new technologies that emerge. So like things like distributed electric propulsion, uh, we see already the impact that this has on the vehicle design of uh, eVTOLs. So we see completely new concepts coming up. Uh, obviously, we have improvements also in terms of structural concepts and we start introducing artificial intelligence and machine learning into classical air traffic management. On the other hand, we have some business drivers. So we see that uh, city integration and infrastructure aspects uh, are becoming very important and also cities driving for a backbone in terms of digital and physical infrastructure. We see passengers uh, not uh, being or being linked to their mobile phone more than ever. Uh, and advanced business models in that area that help us uh, to have a kind of evolution from a premium market towards a mass market. Uh, there will probably be certain steps in that. Today we see a lot of experimentation in terms of new business models that are happening. Um, we certainly believe that at one stage there will be next generation vehicles that will have, that will allow us to lower the cost structure of such a transport and to be able really to uh, increase the market. But then the real scaling probably starts when we discuss about autonomy and, and we are really able to have these kind of vehicles uh, operating in an autonomous and, and safe and reliable way. Um, and this will probably be one of the big challenges. Uh, it's been in the DNA of Airbus and aviation in general over the past decades that safety was uh, one of the biggest drivers. And also traffic has, uh, has doubled nearly every 15 years we see that accidents have been uh, stayed on a very, very low level. And this will obviously become extremely important when we wanna fly into urban areas and, and cities. Um, just a comparison on the left-hand side, you see um, the San Francisco Bay area today with a couple of airplanes flying in and out. 
Uh, on the right hand side, there is a projection done for 2030 with uh, nearly 5,000 vehicles, whether it's uh, drones, airplanes, helicopters, future eVTOLs, and so on. But it already gives you a bit of an impression that there are things that need to change. There is partially a question on the regulatory framework, there are questions on noise, um, there are obviously questions also on, on visual pollution um, and the way this impacts life in a city. Uh, but it also has an impact on how traffic management uh, will work and has to work tomorrow. Uh, today, we see on the left-hand side uh, a typical uh, setup of traffic management today. Uh, tomorrow, there needs to be a much more digitalized way and also different interactions, perhaps even more delocalized uh, between the different actors in the airspace, whether it's a helicopter, an airplane or, or a drone. Um, what we have done so far in the past years in terms of traffic management, so uh, we've issued a blueprint uh, in order to structure a bit the discussion and also have a first step into how this future uh, roadmap of traffic management could look like for autonomous flying. Um, and we started uh, developing services like, like LANs uh, for drone operators to validate the trips and also uh, more going into risk assessment uh, with regards to SORA and others in order to really be able to judge the risk uh, that a certain trip might have and to get uh, clearances from the authorities uh, for a dedicated trip, whether it be a pilot, a drone operator or so ever. And certainly one of the biggest challenges, and, and this is where I would like to end the presentation is also that, uh, and that's something we are all working on is that the use space, so the space where today drones and, and UIS are flying, uh, will slowly grow and connect with uh, the typical air traffic management space as we know it today. And uh, probably by the end of the decade or beginning of the next decade, uh, we will come to a point where we have an integrated system between the typical ATM and the UTM uh, that we are working on to prepare drone operations, eVTOL operations, and so on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Markus. And uh... Yes, I think we continue just before we have any questions with the next uh, uh, kind of competitor of yours, uh, Christian, if you could give us a vision of uh, Volocopter uh, uh, for how air traffic man management could run uh, in the future. Sure. So I hope you can all see my screen. Yes, uh, we see a volocopter. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, I start with that. So uh, thanks for the invitation to speak here today, Willi. Uh, my name is Christian, Christian Bauer, and I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of Volocopter. Uh, volocopter is an air taxi company, as you have already mentioned. And you see our product here. It's an electric vehicle um, to fly, um, um, let's call it, in the beginning manned and later on autonomous from, for example, an airport to the city center, um, a range of roughly about 30 to 35 kilometers before we do a battery swap and fly back. That's the basic concept, let's, let's say. And for a while, stick, stay now one second on that product. I think in the past, we had a lot of questions in this community about air taxes when they will come to life. And I think uh, what we appreciated greatly is that EASA, so the European Commission took a step forward and brought out a regulation or a baseline for us called SCV toll. Um, shortly afterwards, we froze our design, what you see now here. Um, so we, they, perf they gave us the baseline to really now build the series product. So at least on our end, certification is not on any more the big hurdle, but rather now the execution to build such a vehicle. And with that, um, trying or jumping to the next slide, I hope you can see it. Um, one thing is the certification of a product yeah, now that we are uh, in and already in the process uh, since quite some time. Um, the next thing is also um, we do not only want to build a vehicle, but also later on to provide the service to the customer, right? And for that, on the left side, you need customer-centric services, so like an app or an, an interface for the customer. On the right-hand side, you need also a fleet, so a production to build it up. You need also, as Tom and the others mentioned, flight and city operations and also physical ground infrastructure, right? Um, so, for example, on physical infrastructure, 
We built up last year in, um, in Singapore a so-called Molo port. So these nodes will get uh, important. And in the middle, I hope you can see it, it's the digital air traffic management that connects later on the dots uh, with, with each other that we just um, discussed uh, all together here. Before I come to some examples of, of our strategy, what we are doing there, I wanted to, to bring to our attention again, maybe some nomenclature about the controlled airspace or uncontrolled airspace, right? So uh, maybe for the audience um, that, that watches the video, we have A, the controlled airspace, where um, also Markus showed where today uh, legacy aircrafts are operating, flying from an airport to an airport. And we have uncontrolled airspace, basically, you know, the lower airspace where it's today, we have a pilot, he can see other vehicles or aircrafts approaching and he has to react basically. So it's visual line of sight rules, partially connected to control airspace, partially not. And I think the challenge is now for the UTM system, so the unmanned uh, traffic management is, where does it start in controlled airspace? Where does it end in uncon uncontrolled airspace? And how is it defined? And are all the vehicles that operate then in that airspace bound to the same rules? So for example, if there are a small drone um, that delivers a small parcel, can I see it as an unmanned air traffic, um, uh, air taxi or not? So these are questions we, we should consider. And coming to our vision there, I think we will have a step-by-step -step approach. So uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, first, we will start with a piloted, Volocopter, so there will be a pilot sitting in, so a manned vehicle. So this pilot will, for example, start at an airport, right? And he will have a communication device. He can talk to the air traffic controller um, and he can fly from that point also to the city with a connection, maybe, and that was a point from Tom with a Volo port where then an uh, exchange can, can happen today. It was today's, let's call it, regulation. Um, of course, in parallel, we are also working very diligently with system providers like uh, Airbus on the one hand, um, AirMap Unifly, that also um, give solutions for the unmanned traffic management that we can already test now and integrate in our platform, even if we are flying manned, because it, because it could enhance the service in the future. And did there in the last 12 months, I wanted to show you on the next slides. So A, we were part of a consortium called Gov Space. It was a European initiative from the CESAR consortium where a lot of participants, smaller drone companies and us as a air taxi company participated to bring together the consortium of UTM technology providers, air navigation service providers, and to really look how the ATM experience works also cross-border. And what basic routines were then, so we tested the system, you see in the middle a picture of Profsal, we tested um, systems um, you know, at, um, at our platform. So um, feeding into those, let's call it new UTM system data and getting data out from the pre-flight, in-flight and post-flight service, and also integrating then use-based services to ATC rules and regulation was the main, um, you mean the main context we did there, um, together then with the authorities in um, Helsinki, where you see, to, see over there. We had this, um, you know, this demonstration done in August last year. We were connected directly to the tower. Yeah, um, you see the right picture there. So the tower could see us. Uh, we had some transponders in the vehicle. We could see also the legacy planes coming in. And that shows already that those systems in such an environment can work. So from controlled area also to an uncontrolled area. Um, we tested systems like Unifly, AirMap, DFS, Altitude Angel, Nova Systems, and so on. And um, did also another test in, in Singapore in October last year with some of the systems. And our, um, let's call it, main points we took out of that was, I think, you can start 
without those systems if you have a pilot, right? But um, if the air traffic gets more congested, as Marcus mentioned, digital solutions are the help you need because if not, you need a lot of air traffic controller people or um, you know, physically being there and controlling the airspace. Um, secondly, we would need to define then, if we then integrate that and go to an autonomous route, really aircraft minimum equipment. So what does every drone or vehicle have to have on board to be recognized in that space? Also the coverage, as I mentioned, of communication, navigation, surveillance is not always optimal yeah, when you fly outside the control area to the controlled area. So how do you cater with that? The rules of procedures in that um, area also to which altitude can we fly or not? And how do the different UTM systems then that we might have globally, maybe there will be a standard, maybe there will be not, how do they work with each other? So those were the, what call it, outcomes, challenges, questions we are still working on and um, looking forward for your feedback and questions to that. Thanks a lot. Thank you, uh, Christian. Uh, and uh, like, again, we will keep the questions for later. Uh, let me now introduce you, Corbin Hoover, we called all uh, the three others. I know you already quite a while and you know each other probably. Corbin is quite new in this field of uh, eVTOL, at least for the common public. Uh, uh, Corbin, perhaps you tell us a little bit about your approach and what these three technologies is doing. Right, thank you very much, Willy. Um, I've listened very attentively and I'm very excited about what you gentlemen have just reported upon. Um, we have a D3 Technologies AG in Munich is a, is a startup company. Um, so we are the most junior around the table here, quite definitely. Um, we have put together a fairly interesting brain trust of people who are concentrating exclusively on the vertical that you gentlemen have mentioned concerning air traffic management for the, this future UTM use case. Um, my, my presentation is not going to be as hands-on as what we've seen just now. Um, what we are looking at exclusively is how can we build a common platform that will allow various services to interoperate in an urban environment. Um, and I've recognized kind of a lot of the, the upcoming challenges that you gentlemen have mentioned that we are trying to integrate here. Um, we are at present, we're calling the development that we're looking at AirDOS, um, and we call it the Digital Operating System for UAM. We believe that the intercommunication between various players in the various agents in the, in the urban air mobility ecosystem is paramount in order to create a common understanding of what happens in the air. We believe that at the end of the day, a digital twin needs to provide unified data to all the players so that they can rely on a common understanding of what happens in the air. But let me briefly start. Uh, can, you see my, can you see my screens changing now? Yes, it's changing. It's UAM for, hu uh, for human, human transport. transport. Right. Um, so, mirroring what we've heard just now, we s and, and the, um, the, the chart that um, Marcus showed us right now also showed an inflection point of the industry around 25, 26. Um, we believe that the second half of the century will see um, UAM elements as part of the urban transport mix, the modal mix in urban transportation. Um, we understand that in the first use cases, few vehicles, later dozens, and at a later point, as we saw um, in the Bay Area example, uh, thousands of aircraft will need to be coordinated safely in a fairly tight common airspace. 
um, the ex extent of which we don't know yet. We don't know what the altitudes will be, we will be able to use. We also see the fact that piloted and automated aircraft will need to coexist in this space. Um, um, Christian, you just mentioned that fact that uh, there needs to be kind of a coordination between the different operation modes that will be present. Um, we also recognize that initial people movers will be piloted aircraft largely. And our analysis has shown that the adoption of urban air mobility will depend very strongly on the fact that urban planners and the gatekeepers to urban airspace believe that there will be public benefit. Um, we understand that initially there will be kind of um, services that are aimed at the more affluent market, but I think widespread adoption will depend on the fact that the Ubers of this world, the fleet operators prove that uh, there is more than just um, exclusive service that there can be actually widespread service and I believe it's required that all that operate in this field contribute to that to the public benefit that can be created and we believe that part of the public benefit lies in the fact that the cities that want to make use of UAM have are given the opportunity to manage part of the traffic um, and, and um, integrate their considerations into the actual traffic development. Um, we believe that a system that integrates all of the above said aspects needs to provide navigation, unified data, and communication to the ecosystem partners. And that the system in the end needs to be open, open universal, and complete. And just to kind of elaborate a little bit, navigation means that there needs to be strategic deconfliction, um, including the opportunity to kind of offer real-time updates um, after tactical deviations. This means that we believe that initially there will have to be some kind of deterministic traffic planning that allows for a high level safety um, concept to be realized. Um, I will talk about that in a, in a moment. We believe there needs to be a the opportunity to access unified data to get a common situational picture. And we believe that communication between vehicles and the air traffic system needs to include safety critical communication. So um, we do not think that communication is as an add on, but it needs to be a safety critical element of an entire development. Um, we also believe that a system needs to be open. That means that in order to be successful, it needs to be limited not to specific OEMs or transport providers, but needs to offer fair access to a large variety of operators and operation models. It needs to be universal in the sense that it is applicable to different operating types and vehicle types. As we've mentioned before, freight movers, people movers, piloted vehicles, unpiloted vehicles, and it needs to be reasonably complete in order to um, be successful. We have a hard time believing that cities will be able to collect various services into a common system on their own. I believe there needs to be kind of outside, an outside offering that offers a complete system and uh, we are in, we would like to uh, offer such a complete system. Um, now we are developing along a number of tenets um, that may evolve over time, but one of the 
tenets that we are observing is the idea that any system that is capable of managing manned traffic needs to include the, uh, the considerations for manned traffic from day one. We have a hard time believing that um, there can be an evolution, a kind of a gradual evolution in the system itself from a purely unmanned UTM type operation to a manned system. Um, we believe that the experience that is being gathered at this point in time in UTM is extremely valuable and will offer great input, but we also see that um, suggestions need to be made that um, consider the safety criticality of manned systems from day one. Um, we do not believe that detect and avoid, avoid can be a leading safety layer at this point in time. We do not see the technological capability for that at this point. So we believe that there will be a deterministic route planning um, as a top level safety um, consideration initially, and that may change over time. And we also see that obviously any system that is offered needs to evolve over time and start with simple use models and then later um, accommodate the 6,000 that we saw earlier. So these are the tenets that we are looking at. And essentially, we believe that there needs to be a common backbone that combines all the various services that need to be integrated um, and disseminate valid information to all the system participants so that everyone can rely on a unified situational appreciation. And that's what um, V3 is um, spending its time with, and we are quite excited to uh, engage with you in the next weeks, months, and years to find out what your specific requirements are and um, accommodate those in our development. That's that from day three at this point. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Corbin. And so, so now uh, we are open for questions. So first, for example, um, would be great if uh, you uh, um, uh, if you have any questions. If not, I would start and have some questions. Um, first, so but first, uh, you're the guest, so you have the first questions if you have some. Uh, can you kill my screen, Vili? Uh, uh, I think you uh, you have to kill it because you share it, so you have to unshare it. Okay. You have to I, I haven't done anything screen. with the screens of the others before, so normally you should unshare the screen. You have to stop it on the top. You yeah. can stop it. On the top? Yeah. There is because some button. Is not popping up right now. It's a nice aircraft, but <laughs> yeah, that's not what we're talking about. I apologize. <laughs> Here we are. Thank you. Okay, yeah, that's better. Okay, so yeah, any any one of you has questions to somebody else? Okay, then I would say you may think about the question. I have a question on um uh, volocopter and airbus at this point um do you think that uh because you're also you're developing a vehicle and at the same time working on developing the uh, the or a part of the infrastructure do you think there must be uh, uh an infrastructure above the system you have which will coordinate this or do you think that it may be that, for example, a greater area like uh, Paris, San Francisco, Los Angeles would allow and say, okay, um, this is Airbus and Airbus is handling everything in this area. Or do you think there can be different systems operating at the same time? Perhaps, for, uh, like we had the, the presentations, so perhaps Marcus first and then Christian. Um, so, so from from our perspective, what we've seen over the past uh, years of interaction with different cities, 
is that uh, first of all, if you look at city development cycles, they are much, much longer than development cycles in aerospace. Uh, so if we speak about 2030, 2035, then this is today for cities, what they're planning for. Um, and obviously, if there will be a situation where you have several um, infrastructure providers or people looking for that kind of vertipod structures in a city, uh, then it needs to be coordinated by the city. And we believe that this can only be done hand in hand with a city because in the end, what is important from a citizen perspective is that this is integrated into a, a more multimodal system. And this can only work if it is coordinated by the city and if it fulfills a brick. And I think that was also mentioned in one of the presentation saying that it's a, it's a question about how does it fit with other means of transport um, in a dedicated city. And so, yes, there can be several ones, but it needs to be coordinated so that they, there is a common network and a, and, a, and a common purpose that is fulfilled for the dedicated city. Okay, uh, Christian, on this? Yeah, I think your question were two-folded, right? So, A, how do you position yourself and yes. what do you think regional globally, right? So, yes. we position ourselves is on uh, the UTM topic that we look there for a partnership approach. So we will not develop our own UTM system and so on. So I think uh, that's why we also test different uh, systems. So we will rather want to prepare our vehicle to be connectable to different types. So to the ATC, to the UTM, to different system. That's what we uh, yeah. would like. And for that, I think it would be great if there would be one common standard yeah, harmonized how to connect to those systems and how they interoperate. That does not logically mean that there must be worldwide one system. And I do not think that there will be a worldwide one system as we also have different systems today, but they should be based on the same rule set, right? So that's what we mentioned there at, at challenges. So um, I think at the end, it will be a question from the countries and political standpoint Will there be local ANSPs as today who take over that role or will there be independent solution providers who uh, team up with those ANSPs worldwide? So and this question is not answered yet, um, but I think it will be sometimes in a country they will take it over on their own and sometimes it will be managed by an independent one. I think, Tom, you, you probably are already in negotiations with the cities like Melbourne, Bern, like Dallas. So uh, do you think Uber can be the overall organizer for a city like uh, uh, Dallas? Or do you think it will more likely be that there will be Dallas, uh, they, that you will start operating in Dallas and later there will come other operators in and would the Uber system be open to other uh, providers of service? Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's a few questions in here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we actually kind of, I think, pretty strongly believe uh, in, in distributed systems. Uh, that there will be multiple providers overall and that we need to architect it to, to be able to have multiple providers. I also agree with Marcus, by the way, that it's probably going to end up being different in different parts of the world and, and, and certain countries and, and will probably handle it differently. But, but overall, at least in the US uh, and in, in Australia and in other places right now, I mean, we are we're certainly pursuing a path um, where there can be multiple um, UTM providers uh, interact with each other. Uh, where we're working really hard on, on defining the standards. I mean, this has been going on even back when I was at NASA. We've, we've been starting to do the conversation uh, amongst many, many providers that, that work is still going on. We're still working very closely with NASA and the um, FAA and, and many other providers to actually define what are those, those communication standards that we need to have in order to, to have uh, multiple providers coexist uh, in certain spaces. Uh, I, I do think, of course, that uh, Uber is uh, in a different position than a lot of other uh, folks because we already have a, have a big ride-sharing business on the ground um, and, and we can provide this multimodal connectivity that we've been talking about. And, and, and in certain cities, we already integrate into public transport, like in Denver here. So, so we can actually really provide an end-to-end -end journey and, and take up the, the um, airport as part of it. 
but we're also uh, working very hard on, on making sure that if other providers uh, want to work with other partners, they can do this as well. And, and that we basically all have common APIs and, and common uh, things that, that people can connect uh, into, right? Uh, we are, I mean, our whole approach to this is essentially based on, on partnerships with vehicle partners. So, so we're certainly open to having uh, any, any partner come, come on our network where it makes sense, where, where it fits into our, our business case. Uh, and, and we are basically running and, and developing what we think is, is core to our own, own business model. And, and that is kind of the automation platform, the ride sharing platform, those types of things that, that we've been doing for, for many years as a technology company. Um, but uh, then when you say you, you will be the ride sharing platform, but then there would be some, because some kind of ATC above it, who would have to do the coordination? It would not an eight, or how would this work? No, we. Uh, I mean, again, we we do think uh, we can agree with uh, the the ANSPs and the regulators' oversight. We can agree on on the rules. Uh, we can agree, like the, the the initial approach, for example, of getting into controlled airspace that we're pursuing is is defining basically passages or corridors through controlled airspace mm -hmm. that that we will. Uh, in, in which you can do the UAM type operations, probably this might be VFR operations, this might be drones, but we are trying to coordinate through a UTM system and, and you do the deconfliction through that type of system. And that doesn't have to be a central system. So it, it can also be coordinated through rules and, and you can do this decentralized as long as everybody agrees on uh, exactly what, what are the, the algorithms and the rules that you're gonna have to use there. Okay, question to Corbin. Do you think um, you know that the system which we will have will be as for the uh, urban air traffic uh, will be more or your approach is more likely developing it from a system which is kind of similar to the existing system with transponders and so on? Or do you think that the, I think I understood your presentation that you think uh, it would more likely be a totally new system developed from the scratch uh, which uh, you are working on? Well, really, I, the, it's quite clear that the regu one of the very few fixed items in the regulations right now in this entire topic is the fact that whatever we do has to be compatible with whatever exists already. So, um, number one, there will have to be an intercommunication between the existing system and the whatever comes in the future. Um, I am not convinced that the very exact technology we're using, the, um, the ADSB technology or whatever is being used at this point will be what will be flying on all of these um, VTOLs in 10 years time. I believe that there is an opportunity to jump to a next generation of equipment. I believe also from a cost point of view, it won't be feasible to have a full avionics suite on board aircraft that will cost about as much as the vehicle itself does. So I'm, my guess at this time is that yes, it will be a new system and yes, it will also be compatible or at least communicable with the existing system. So um, I doubt that the, the exact solutions that we're seeing in standard aviation today will be adopted, but there will be um, commonality in, in information exchange. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Marcus, I uh, have a question for you. Like Airbus is a big system provider. Would you, or could you think then, for example, flying on a, uh, when you have a vehicle which would fit in on an Uber system, or would it more likely be that Airbus would say, no, we, we have to have our own system if we want to operate in this area? I think for us, to be honest, it's too early to answer that question. I mean, you mentioned before the word uh, competitor. Uh, I believe you can compete if you have a market. Um, today, I think we we don't have a market. Uh, I consider most of the people here on the call also as being part of the pioneers that try to push a bit the boundaries of what we have today. 
Um, and for us to, to decide on that is too early. We definitely have a legacy in terms of vehicle design, I would say. Uh, we also have a legacy in terms of uh, air traffic management services. Um, and, and these are certainly things that we want, uh, want to continue. But we believe that all this kind of uh, world of urban air mobility will only work if we have a focus on, on the ecosystem and on the value chain. Uh, if I compare that, for instance, with uh, what Uber has achieved in revolutioning a taxi service, um, I believe what we're trying to do here is even an order of magnitude higher uh, because uh, when Uber arrived, uh, uh, cars were existing, drivers were existing, and roads were existing. Um, and, and some of these infrastructure elements, we are just trying to build them for the service we want to provide. So um, I believe we have a big uh, challenge in front of us. Uh, and along that way, we will only succeed if we build uh, partnerships between the different stakeholders and, and move that barrier together. Okay. Um question to uh, Christian uh, you you mentioned that you want to have the vehicle that the vehicle and the organization around the vehicle but that you would look for example for uh, uh, an umbrella above who would do the real traffic management on the city or on the regional level um, so uh, is Volocopter saying that for example, when you go to, to, to Singapore, it will be first single operation, which you do probably managed by yourself, coordinated with ATC. But in the next step, would you then look for a, a partner who would provide the whole system and you would deliver the vehicles and the ports? Or would it be that you also think that you would develop a whole system uh, beyond this? I mean, it's always, thanks for the question. Um, it's a good one. I think it's always a question, of how do you define system, platform, uh, and so on. So of course, when we go to a city, now in the beginning, as Marcus mentioned, being pioneers, you have to offer them the full service portfolio. Yeah, so end-to-end -end service from a Volo port, from, you know, so a takeoff and landing area, uh, to the vehicle, to a customer service at the end. I think our approach is just, let's not reinvent the wheel and where already existing parts exist, let's partner up. Yeah. Um, so in the, when, you, when you would take the example of Singapore, of course we would deliver their end-to-end -end service, but who the partner is there on the UTM side, I think we are open. And I think we leave it also up to the, to the city, to the state, um, uh, to decide there. But we will have our service on our end, the customer service and the vehicle ready to interconnect them. This is why we are testing with all those different system vendors to get our product better, better there. I think this is the, 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 the real topic there. So if you approach to this, we also have the full approach, but of course, along our value chain, and we did that also from the past on, we partner up with partners like Airport, we partner with Fraport, yeah, or, or we partner also on the real estate side, you know? So, because you cannot do everything on your own um, uh, if you want to, to be uh, there one of the first and also, um, let's call it cash conscious on the way. Okay, question to Tom from Uber. Uh, do you have the experience when you talk with cities? Because when you talk with city officials like in LA, like in Dallas, they will not be, they are not aviation specialists. They normally, they, organize something totally different. When there is an airport, there is an airport and this goes to specialists. But when it goes to intercity traffic, um, do you have to teach them a lot about your vision? Or do you think uh, they, they already have a clear vision what they want? I mean, um, I think this is different, certainly for, for different cities as well. Uh, some some of the cities actually have a pretty good understanding of their future planning, and, and they, they might have uh, already worked with with other companies, other consultants, or something to 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 give them their 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 own independent models. So uh, the discussions can be more educated right from from the get go. Um, of course, we also have our kind of our own vision, and and uh, we were coming at it from from potentially different perspectives, mm -hmm. uh, and rightfully so. I mean, we we wanna we wanna uh, build a business for, for for many people, of course, uh, 
um, and and the cities also want to want to create something uh, for all their citizens um, that are in there. That's that's kind of very um, equitable and and involves other other means of transport as well. Um, I think these are all uh, very important and, and very good discussions and, and this, this whole community engagement is, is like one of the most important pieces of the puzzle because if we can't get the communities to, to buy into the, the operations there, they're never going to happen. Okay, uh, another question on a detail which I would ask to Corbin, which is uh, you're thinking a lot about this uh, management system and you had communication is one uh, important por part of this uh, we will have uh, at the beginning i think everybody agreed mainly uh, manned vehicles where you still have kind of piloted vehicles and there will be not autonomous manned vehicles flying from the beginning and um, what do you think will be this communication like first will it be uh, g5 or are there any, any other options um, and uh, will it be, will there still, when there are pilots on there, will there still be voice communication or do you think it will be all data-driven communi communication like when it goes along? I think the answer to your question depends on the state we're looking at. Um, as has been mentioned before, we, we have, we're looking at a development that will go over from today into the in, 07, 08, 09, into, until 2030 and beyond that, and we'll see different solutions coming up over time. Um, one of the challenges we have right now is that there is no common understanding of what the data volume will be that is required to manage complex systems. This is a fairly fundamental <laughs> academic and practical challenge. I think the academic community right now is not agreed on an optimum solution for data traffic. Um, a lot of talk is, there's a lot of talk about um, G5 at this point in time. Um, we feel that um, G5 has challenges where um, distance is concerned. Um, if we had to make an early bet, we would also be looking at industrial channels on the G4 frequencies. But um, at this point in time, I don't think there's a, a fixed answer to this. Um, I believe the challenge will be the data communication. Um, I believe as long as there are pilots on board, there will be voice communication because the a pilot, in order to exercise his authority, a pilot needs to be given, he has to be able to communicate, um, he has to be able to receive instructions or limitations from the ground, um, which in theory could be done via data channels, but in early practice it certainly will be voice. So, um, as we've heard before, um, the initial operations, point-to-point -point operations, will be very, very similar to what we see today because they will be largely experimental or um, case by case approved operations. Um, I think one of, the ch one of the challenges we'll be looking at is how do you integrate the autonomy of an individual, a pilot, into a system that is largely keyed towards managing automated vehicles um, we are proposing a number of solutions for the integration of the man in the loop into an, a largely automated system. Um, but we will be seeing we will be seeing an evolution of both the techno technological solution and um, the communication requirements. Um, so at this point, I would not want to make a bet on any. Um, mode, uh, communication mode. Any a question, uh, could say quick question to all three of the others. Um, do you think uh, G5 will play a big role or not? Just because I think this is a discussion which I heard very, very often. So it would be interesting to have your point of view if it will be 
more rather G5 or more, more rather something else when you start your service. And you continue the way along. Perhaps first uh, um, Tom, then Margaret, and then Christian. Uh, I, I think, again, this is, uh, it, it needs to be a reliable and redundant communications channel, whatever that might be. I, I do think it's going to be probably primarily, uh, pri the, the primary is going to be some, likely some offshoot of a, of a cell uh, service. So 5G, of course, is a uh, potential one, but there, there may also have to be like a backup setcom link. Um, it's, it's still sort of whatever can be approved if we need like aviation spectrum, if we can use other spectrum. This, these things are still a little bit unclear, but we, we have to get clarity in the next mm -hmm. few months. I mean, we are experimenting and or we have been experimenting at our copter flights in New York with, with different carriers, different mm -hmm. services and see what the coverage is. Right now it's not there for, for uh, the, the altitudes even at, at which we're flying. There's, there's definitely gaps in there. So the providers will also need to get a fair amount of uh, incentive to actually focus on, on that part of it compared to still thousands of aircraft compared to millions of cell phones is not a, not a huge amount. So, so there's gotta be some incentive to actually step forward and, and build that service. But again, I think it's gonna be some, I, I, don't, I don't really agree that uh, the primary means should be voice communication. As soon as we scale, we're gonna, gonna run into uh, the same scalability issues that we have today. Okay, Marcus, on this one? Um, yeah, on, on the question on 5G, I mean, it's for me a general topic when it comes to connectivity. So what can we guarantee? And it will definitely have a big impact on uh, to what extent uh, we, we fulfill the safety criteria that we will have. And uh, if you look at the overall system, I mean, we have quite high safety standards in aviation. Uh, this is relevant for certifying a vehicle according to the SC VTOL. Um, but on the other hand, this will also be relevant to the overall system. And if I listen to the experts uh, in our engineering department, uh, they still have some doubts on how this will work from a connectivity perspective. And this will be one of the main challenges to what extent uh, we can guarantee uh, safety standards on the overall operations. Um, and, and this is something that we still need to figure out where uh, if 5G is sufficient for that or to what extent that will lower um, the barrier, the safety barrier to a point that we cannot certify that anymore. Okay, Christian. Yep. Yeah, just in a nutshell, I think uh, nearly all being said, I think similar opinion here. So we are also exploring different solutions right now. 5G being one, the topic cybersecurity attached to what Marcus meant to 5G to be explored and how to make it then safe. Mm. Also tackle it from two perspectives. A, the, con the customer. Yeah, so if you then later on want to stream a lot, so you should have a good connection. As a customer, even if it's only a short flight, everybody wants to be online all the time. And if we go away from dedicated routes, yeah, so in the beginning, A to B, maybe later A to Z or hops somewhere, then you need really an infrastructure that covers a whole area and city. So I just wanted to bring out those two perspectives, but the rest already, already being said by, the, by Tom and Marcus. Okay, I have to check with you because uh, I, we did say about an hour, your time schedule, if you're still fine. I'm really interested, so I would like to continue, but you have to tell me uh, when uh, your time is off and that we have to close the session. Everybody still I have five, five minutes? I have five more minutes. So Five more minutes, yeah, no problem. Okay, so yeah, let's do uh, any question of one of you while hearing the others um, to one of the others? Um, I would have a question uh, and I would like to link with something that Christian said before that um, on your side, you're focusing on basically having a pilot on board and uh, using that phase of piloted aircraft basically also to test other systems and then to remove that pilot at one uh, point in time and go to something that is more uh, autonomous. Um, and I would like it to link to the experience that Uber has in, in, in the ride sharing business, because I, th I believe and if we look at roads, uh, you have gone through that whole step of autonomous driving already. Uh, you know what implications it has on a, on a technical level, but also on a public acceptance level. Um, and I would like just to get, get, uh, get your view on why, when do you think this is going to happen for, uh, for, the, for the aircraft industry, basically? 
Um, yeah, I think those are really good points. I mean, we've had uh, like a lot of research on self-driving cars for a long time and we, we don't still don't have any real autonomous uh, cars um, driving around uh, because uh, the, um, I mean, for, for a new service, there's always a, a much higher uh, kind of barrier and, and uh, expectation on, on safety. Like, well, well we have uh, lots and lots of uh, accidents with cars all, all the time that's sort of accepted, but it's not acceptable for, for an autonomous car in a sense. So, so in, in, if you translate that to, to aerospace, I think it's, it's kind of the same thing. A large aircraft accident today is not acceptable to anybody. And if you, if you have an autonomous aircraft that has an accident, that's also going to have a much higher barrier than a GA aircraft, for, for example, today. So, so I do think we need a lot of time to actually really prove out the autonomous technology make, uh, with pilots on board. Uh, make sure that uh, we, we can prove that there haven't been any pilot interventions uh, on, on certain routes for a long period of time. And, and you might be able to, to then, actually, it's not a one uh, all or nothing type deal. I think you can take out the pilot maybe on specific routes initially that, again, you've proven out there's a, a really uh, no, no problems. It's not very complex. Uh, we, we, over a year of operations, we, we've never had to have a pilot intervene or something. And then you can, can go there. Kind of similar to how we, we, why we think that actually autonomous cars with a ride sharing business are more practical because you can limit the scope of where you dispatch an autonomous car, for example. Well, you can say, okay, I've, I've totally mapped out this part of the city, this one, and we, we feel super confident that our autonomous cars will work here and, and we'll only dispatch an autonomous car for a rider that wants to go from A to B that's within the area that we've mapped out. As soon as we go outside, we will dispatch a car that has a driver on board, for example. And, and so for, for, again, the aircraft analogy, it could be that you have certain routes where you, you start out with autonomous vehicles after a certain period of time, but if, if for more complex things, you might still have a piloted service for a while. Okay, thank you. I have opinion also maybe um, adding, coming from formerly from the car industry, I mean, the biggest challenge there is that you have accuracy on five centimeters in the city, right? So you have to be very, very precise there when you drive an automated car, even in the city center when something pops up. I think in, still in the sky, there is more luxury on space. So it's, it's called five centimeters left, right is not the biggest issue there. Um, having said that, I think as, as Tom also mentioned out, it will be a question of training the vehicle um, and, and your system to, um, to uh, a safety level, yeah, as, you, as you know. And, you, and I think, and also interested how you see it, Marcus, but I think also the question will be, um, will it be a zero to 100% or will it be a zero percent to 50 to 75%? Meaning, will we start with automated services with still a pilot sitting in? So uh, some functions being already there. Um, as we see in today in conventional planes, and when will the pilot himself go out completely? I think uh, this is more the question mark. From a technological point of view, there are still some challenges, but um, it's already proven that it's possible. So uh, this is not the issue on this end. So when, uh, just a quick, quick question on you. When do you think it will be? Because you asked the question, so what is your answer to this question? Um, I don't have a concrete answer on when it will happen, but coming back to what Christian said before, yeah. I think there are two main aspects. One is the technical, technological mm -hmm. one. And if I speak uh, with people in the car industry or in the aircraft industry, many people say from a technical perspective, it's easier to have autonomous flying than autonomous driving because of the precision Christian mentioned, mm -hmm. but because also of the, the, the things that can happen in a city on the road are completely different than happen, can happen in sky. Um, but there is a second aspect, and I'm not 100% not sure about that, and that is for me public acceptance. And I ask myself, would we be able as a society or would we be ready to accept autonomous flying if we don't accept autonomous driving yet? And that is more a psychological aspect that is probably playing and that will be perhaps even more important than the fact of what we are te technically capable of doing. Mm. Um, because as, uh, as Tom mentioned, I mean, uh, there has been a lot of research about a lot of testing and things, but we're still not there. And probably some of the main questions we will have in that area 
are also linked to uh, insurance and, and what happens if an accident occurs. So these are things that are outside of the technical scope. And I believe uh, these ones are things that, uh, that, that we can't control uh, just from a purely technical perspective. Okay, good. Anything to add? And uh, if I may, yeah. Um, yeah, I just have a quick question. Uh, uh, I'm Shingo, I'm a uh, video scholar. Uh, I just have a very quick question for um, uh, Uber Airbus and Volocopter. Uh, the question is how, well, how, you, how you think will this coronavirus ep epidemic uh, affect um, your product development and the UAM? The situation is that um, uh, because now during the coronavirus in China, there, ha uh, there has been some quite large scale cargo drone delivery um, application like SF Express, that's the largest um, um, express delivery company in China. They used, um, uh, they used cargo drones. In 32 days, they, deliver, they, they delivered a total of 11 tons of cargo in five cities. So uh, we believe that's uh, the uh, largest uh, scale of drone um, cargo uh, um, application so far. So the question is, uh, do you think after this uh, pandemic, um, cargo drone uh, application will have a higher priority than passenger UAM? And how would that affect the product development? Because as we all know, if the cargo drone has a higher priori priority, um, the, the pilot will be uh, taken out of the loop and everything will be quite different, like certification and everything. Yeah, so thank you. So perhaps, um, uh, uh, Mark, you can begin. Uh, yeah, I can start. I mean, I think it's it's pretty much linked to the question of um, of what is the usage of that and and how does it help getting public mm -hmm. acceptance. And I believe if we look at at drone deliveries and what's happening right now, um, then yes, medical applications is something that has a big use for society and is also perceived uh, as that. So um, I think. The fact that we have the current crisis uh, can also help us accelerate things that we probably wouldn't have done before or that were judged as less important. Um, some of the business models for medical cargo are, are difficult, uh, but I think in the, in the current crisis, they show how valuable they are and how much benefit they can bring to society. And, and that's something that we, that we need to keep in mind. Um, I don't see it as a prioritization one over the other. Um, I still believe that uh, when we speak about the usage of airspace, uh, whether this is a cargo drone, an EVTOL, a, a helicopter or something else, in the end they use the same airspace. So uh, one might help us to open up uh, the skies or to use more digital ways of doing air traffic management, um, but it doesn't mean that this is exclusive for that kind of vehicle, but that it could open it up for the other types as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. So Tom, do you think um, Uber may um are looking more at uh, this cargo drone, like a Uber Eats kind of application? Well, I mean, this is what we're definitely seeing uh, in the current situation that, that uh, okay. clearly um, rights, shared rights have gone down significantly and uh, Eats and, and deliveries uh, are picking up quite a bit. So, so you can definitely see, but, but this is because uh, obviously most, most cities have a shelter in place. Um, order and, and people are staying at home and so so they're, they're looking much more at deliveries and, and especially contactless deliveries that, that maybe drones could provide would be quite useful. Uh, I don't think the, the um, I mean yeah cargo drones is, is one one thing but like the, the drones that deliver food to your doorstep are probably not quite there yet but there could be some um, additional momentum in, into this. Uh, generally, I think it'll all depend. It's, it's, it's very hard to predict uh, what the, when we get out of this um, current crisis, um, what the sentiment of the people is going to be. I mean, are they going to go back to, to being very, very uh, eager to uh, travel themselves and, and, and go to in-person meetings? Or are we going to go more into to a society where people are going to stay more at home and are going to rely more on deliveries. I, I don't know that anybody can actually predict this today, what's going to happen. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. And, and that might shift a little bit, uh, like um, Marcus was saying, this might shift a little bit the priorities here and there on, on, on what you do. I, I don't think in the long run, um, I, I, I personally think in the long run, we're going to go uh, be using all those means 
and and we we are going to have increased uh, urban air mobility with passengers uh, we we are also going to have additional means to deliver things to people uh, overall but as far as um, the momentum i, I don't think uh, it's going to going to change that we need to be able to integrate these new new vehicles into the airspace Thank you. I also think, um, you know, um, hopefully this crisis worldwide will go over and hopefully all stay safe. Um, and as Tom mentioned, we don't know um, how the behavior will change of the people or when we will see um, an improvement there that hope hopefully occurs soon. Um, I think uh, this, um, nevertheless, those times show and increase the speed of digitalization, right? As you have seen in, in China, or if, as you've seen right now, we're doing that digitally. So this is improving. Um, um, but I think the trend overall of e-commerce uh, was growing already before. Yeah? So I think this was a general trend that we saw before worldwide. Um, and this will continue in this situations even more. So on our end, I think we we announced in November last year that we also bring a, a project out called Volo Drone. So it's a heavy lift drone. And to answer your question that, yes, of course, we also foresee there next to cargo services, logistic services, where we partnered up with DB Schenke, also medical services or others. So um, for us, it's a field, but I would see that now independently of the current situation, anyhow a trend, how to have more means of transportation also in the logistic area um, in that kind of field. Yeah. I think as we have to watch for the time and I don't want to keep you too long, right. perhaps we give yeah. a chance to very quick have an answer on this question as well. And then I would, uh, would sum up. And uh, again, thank you for, uh, for you all. And uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. So thank you very much. Stay healthy. And... Uh